Good, then welcome to today's uh, bonus session. Uh, thank you for your contributing um, at the poll, what to do this morning. And you decided to have a look at synthetic computability theory, excellent choice. So let's do that. Um, uh, let, uh, I'm, uh, let me state one thing first. I'm not an expert in synthetic computability theory. Um, but I think I will be able to give an introduction to that beautiful sub subject. Um, and I will use several sets of slides from other people and, and to like cherry pick uh, things which um, I find useful for the day. And I will link all those slides um, later on. Um, let's start with a set of slides by Yannick Forster, who is one of the um, most accomplished people um, in synthetic computability theory, by the way, also a very young person. Um, I, I don't know his age, but uh, he's like not a full professor, but a postdoc like, like myself. Um, and um, he considers as motivation um, this theorem in computability theory. Um, it's the so-called SMN theorem, celebrated theory in computability theory. Um, it's very important, but also, good morning, you're welcome. Um, but also um, the, the proof is a little bit hairy. So here is a proof in, in, in some random textbook, um, but it's not actually a formal proof. Um, in the end, the author appeals to Church's thesis Church's thesis states uh, approximately that um, every, every procedure which you can, every algorithmic procedure which you can think of can also be implemented as a Turing machine. You know? It's like a, a credo of optimism that every programming task which is solvable in principle can actually be solved as a Turing machine. Nobody really disputes Church's thesis, um, at least that version which I just uh, described. Um, but still, there's a difference between actually carrying out the programming exercise and just claiming, hoping that it is likely possible to, to do it. Um, and indeed, if we, if we just appeal to Church's thesis, um, then then it will be hard to, for instance, have a close look at the runtime behavior of our program, because if you just are like arguing in a hand wave, hand waving fashion, then we don't know precisely like how many while loops are nested into it, you know, stuff like that. So there is an, another author in computability theory, in ordinary computability theory, and that an another author um, also did not provide a full proof. However, um, they pro provided more details. And then it looks like this. Um, OK, so now we have a better or more, de more detailed proof of the SMN theorem. But also, I think you argue, um, I, I think you agree that this can never be a memorable proof. How, however, it will look like in detail. Let's scroll into it. Um, we have a couple of prime numbers there. And lots of lots of four y plus nine, yeah. It, it, so uh, it, this should, this is a very uh, fundamental theory in computability theory. It's not about prime numbers. This is not a textbook on prime numbers. It's a textbook on computability theory. But at some point, we need prime numbers and and stuff like four y plus nine. Obviously, that isn't how things should be in like a better world. Yeah. Um, it's still not a fully formal proof. It's still an English proof with lots of gaps, uh, or at least with lots of things not spelled out. Um, so what uh, other people did was to um, translate that proof into COC, into COC code. And then it looked like this. OK, now we have a fully formal proof. Uh, definitely no gaps in it. But also, it's a quite long proof. and it's not really a conceptual proof. Lots of prime numbers again and stuff we shouldn't need to care about when doing computability theory. Um, Andre Bauer um, 
puts it, uh, summarizes the situation as follows. So computability theory is very cool. It has lots of surprising theorems. It contains clever programs and clever proofs. It's a beautiful subject, but then also some proofs contain horrible expressions like this, which, which makes sense if you like really look at it and, and spend your time on it. But this is, this is just not nice to, to look at or to work with. The question is, can we do better? Um, and the answer is yes, we can by doing computability theory in a synthetic fashion. Um, the idea is um, that we um, that we introduce new anti-classical axioms, axioms which contradict classical mathematics, but which have the advantage that um, that now a formalization of computability theory is much simpler than before. Um, uh, synthetic computability theory is not the only synthetic account of a mathematical subject. There are many. Um, for instance, there's also synthetic differential geometry. I will say something about that in a minute. There, we adopt new axioms such that differential geometry becomes easier. There's synthetic algebraic geometry, which is um, um, uh, which is an area which I'm personally active on. Um, there's synthetic homotopy theory, better known as um, homotopy type theory. Um, then there's synthetic computability theory. And um, in fact, this uh, idea of, of a synthetic approach to, to subjects of mathematics is not new. In fact, it's very, very old. Um, and I think you all know a synthetic approach to a certain subject in mathematics, even if you haven't studied it in detail. Um, I think it's 2000 years old. Um, the, that synthetic approach um, was written down in a book for almost 2000 years. This was the, the most selling or most used book in the world. Um, only later, like the Bible came uh, and then also other famous books, but for almost 2000 years, that was the most well-known book. And it was not only some random book, but it was a textbook for teaching school students. And for 2000 years, it was the same textbook, quite a bit of stability. Do you know which branch of mathematics I'm referring to? It's um, Euclidean geometry. So the stuff about triangles, circles, stuff like this. Um, the original formulation due to Euclid, or perhaps also other researchers from the time, I'm not an expert in the history of Euclidean geometry, um, uh, employed a synthetic approach. Um, let, me, let me explain with the example of synthetic Euclidean geometry what, uh, what the synthetic business means. Um, so what Euclid did is, um, he postulated, um, just postulated without further explanation of what this is, he postulated that there's a thing called points, um, a notion of points, um, a notion of lines, and then had axioms. Some say um, it's not really axioms, but rules of a type theory, but let's not stress about the difference right now. X, uh, then he postulated axioms like um, 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 every two dis dis uh, every two distinct points are connected by a line. Given two points, we can draw a line through it. Stuff like that. Notice that he did not talk about things like the following. The real numbers um, or the sine function from the real numbers to the real numbers or um, um, let's say this vector space uh, R to the two. Um, he also did not 
um, talk about uh, the number pi in the sense of, um, uh, of having better and better approximations available. Um, this would be the so-called analytic uh, approach. Um, analytic roughly means in this context that we um, try to analyze even the apparently fundamental notions like points and lines um, in terms of even more basic fundamental notions. Um, and in the end, nowadays, um, the most fundamental notion available to us, if you follow uh, the ideas of classical mathematics at least, um, is the notion of a set. Um, nowadays, if you want to, we can found Euclidean geometry just on sets. Uh, let me explain how this works. Um, um, so we start out just with the notion of sets with nothing else. And then uh, now we need to bootstrap ourselves. For instance, we need to define natural numbers. If, if all we have is sets, then we don't have natural numbers first, but we can define natural numbers. We can say the number zero is the empty set. That's the definition. Then we can define the number one is the set containing the empty set. So this one. Then we can define the number two is the set containing one and zero and one. So it's this set. Um, and then we can continue and continue and continue. And in this way, we have constructed out of the empty set uh, and the allowed operations for, uh, for creating new sets, we have created the natural numbers. And then um, have a look at some textbook on foundations of mathematics uh, from N. We can define the integers. And then from the integers, we can define uh, the rationals as pairs of integers, modulo some equivalence relation. And then if we have Q, then we can define oops, uh, the reals. Um, there are several constructions available for that. One is using Cauchy sequences. Another is using Dedekind cuts. Uh, we also briefly had a discussion on day one with um, how the reals can be cr created from the rationals using a higher inductive type. Okay, and then if we have the reals, then um, we create this vector space, um, R to the two, and then um, continue defining stuff, constructing stuff out of earlier stuff um, until at some point we arrive in a situation where we can actually do Euclidean geometry when we have our square squared and in the sine function and a couple other things defined. Um, so on the one hand, it's, uh, it's amazing that starting just from the empty set, um, we can define all those other interesting mathematical notions and objects, and in the end obtain Euclidean geometry or a context to work with, where to do, to carry out Euclidean geometry. Uh, that is really astonishing that set theory is so flexible. Um, it's like a universal language for mathematics because set theory, and by the way, also type theory, um, does not only support doing Euclidean geometry, it also supports doing partial differential equations or computability theory or, um, or logic or whatever. Almost any branch of mathematics or computer science can in principle be carried out within set theory. That's amazing. However, it also comes at a price, namely, um, so we just wanted to, to do triangles and circles, but now we needed to have stuff like this beast of curly braces. Yeah? And then all of those other things, even more curly braces appearing. And we need to, um, to invest quite a bit of work until we arrive at a situation where we can now do uh, Euclidean geometry. And the synthetic approach just um, uh, shortcuts all of that. In the synthetic approach, we just postulate that there's a notion of points, there's a notion of lines, and then a couple of axioms we need, and then we get going from there. We don't care about implementing Euclidean geometry using set theory. We can, and uh, occasionally um, it's very helpful that we can because there are some theorems in Euclidean geometry which are quickly proven 
using stuff like the sine function and other tools from other branches of mathematics, which are set in set theory, but which, um, uh, which don't make sense per se uh, in the setting of Euclidean geometry. So it's very nice that we have this analytic approach available if needed, but it's um, much more economical to work synthetically for as long as possible. That's a general idea of, of a synthetic account or branch of mathematics. Yeah. 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 Um, yes, that depends a little bit on the specifics. In general, yes. Um, the thing is, um, for so each synthetic approach to some mathematical subject requires its own set of additional axioms. In the set, in the in the in the case of Euclidean geometry, you need axioms regarding points and lines and stuff, circles. Um, in um, in synthetic computability theory, we will, I'll introduce that in a second. Um, we require totally different axioms, not related to points and lines, but to um, to things mim mimicking computation in some sense. Yeah? Uh, now the issue is the following. The axioms of synthetic computability theory, they contradict classical mathematics. These axioms don't contradict classical mathematics uh, at all. Yeah? They, you can just additionally postulate them and still have the logs through the middle available as you wish. Uh, that's not the case in synthetic computability theory. And in fact, it's seldomly the case in synthetic approaches to mathematics that we can keep classical logic. Um, synthetic homotopy theory is an exception and synthetic Euclidean geometry is an exception, but all the other synthetic approaches I know, and there are a couple more than those listed here, they are incompatible with classical mathematics. That is the price we need to pay in some sense. Um, but still, all those synthetic approaches have a connection to classical mathematics, to usual set theory, because um, in the context of classical set theory, we can construct models of those synthetic approaches. Um, for instance, a model of Euclidean geometry would be R squared, the vector space R or the affine space R, R squared constructed in set theory. And um, these models um, are um, um, are then so these models are then uh, then exist in the context of classical mathematics. So you have classical mathematics again, and they are very nice to have. Uh, one reason why they are nice is because they ensure that um, your the axioms you wrote down uh, were not some crazy fantasy axioms which which are just contradictory, for instance. Yeah? And another uh, reason why uh, they um, uh, why the, the existence of those models is nice is because they connect the synthetic approach to the already existing analytic approach in the literature. Um, yeah, uh, I will I will provide examples uh, very soon when we when we do synthetic computability. Perhaps uh, let's do that um, now. Okay. Um, here's an example. In ordinary analytic computability theory, uh, we have theorems like um, there um, is a Turing machine which checks whether a given number is prime or not. That's a theorem we could state and then prove in ordinary computability theory. Yeah? Um, how can we do that in synthetic computability theory? Um, there are several flavors of that and so on. I will stick to the most basic flavor. Um, the most basic flavor, flavor is to employ the effective corpus. 
which you've already learned about yesterday, uh, because working in the effective purpose just I mean, amounts to working within the realizable, uh, realizability model. Yeah? Um, this theorem refers to Turing machines and uh, the proof requires explicit uh, construction of Turing machines. Yeah. Um, in synthetic computability theory, we express the same theorem more simply as follows. Every number, every natural number is prime or not. Observe, no mention of Turing machines. This feels just like ordinary mathematics, by, by, by which I mean like the kind of mathematics not carried out by computer scientists. Ordinary mathematics about numbers. Every number is prime or not. Um, uh, in particular, we do not need to construct some Turing machine in order to prove that. We just give a proof but every number is prime or not. And uh, what do I mean by the same theorem? It doesn't look like the same theorem. This theorem is a, a theorem about just prime numbers. Um, I could, uh, of course, it's a little bit weird from a classical point of view, but still I could talk about this theorem on the very first day of university before introducing Turing machines and so on. Whereas uh, this theorem here, makes explicit mention of Turing machines. So I cannot talk about that theorem on the very first day of university because the students still don't yet know what a Turing machine is. I claim that they are still the same theorem in a deeper sense because um, the connection is as follows. Um, the theorem above holds if and only if the theorem below, so the synthetic theorem, Whole, if and only if the theorem below holds in the effective purpose. You can, you don't need to trust me on that. You have all the tools in order to check that because you know that a theorem holds in the effective purpose if and only if the theorem is realizable. And the claim that this theorem here is realizable is exactly the claim that there's a Turing machine which checks whether a given number is prime or not. So um, to do synthetic computability theory amounts to doing ordinary mathematics without talking about machines in the effective topos. That's the general idea of the most basic flavor of synthetic computability theory. And then there are lots of um, uh, extensions and variants. Synthetic computability theory work internally to the effective topos. All the computability structure we are actually interested in um, is automatically taken care of by, by the realizability semantics, by this uh, alternative universe, namely the effective topos, um, which frees us from having to track computability issues on our own. We just um, state and then prove this theorem about numbers, every number is prime or not. In proving that we need perhaps an induction proof, but no knowledge of Turing machines. But then if we, um, if we zoom out and um, assume the position of an external mathematician, we observe that in actual fact, we have proven this much more advanced theorem about computability. Uh, the status of prime numbers. That's uh, a first, um, first example. Any questions, comments, ideas right now? Then my plan would be to show you one more example. Um, in ordinary computability theory, we have the following theorem, very important theorem. Um, there is no, um, well, 
the set of all total computable functions from n to n is not recursively enumerable. Perhaps you have heard of that. The set of all total computable functions is not recursively enumerable. Let's quickly check what it, uh, the ingredients of that theorem, what they state. So this is about functions from n to n. More precisely about total functions. Um, total just means that given any input, the function actually produces an output. Um, uh, that is just for, for, for being maximally precise. The default of a function of the notion of function is to be a total function. If I want to talk about partial functions, um, like the division function, which is not defined at zero, uh, then I need to be explicit and say partial function. Okay, and this is not about all functions from n to n, but about the computable functions, those functions which are computable by a Turing machine. We could also think about what happens with super Turing machines, but let's um, stick to the basic situation. Okay, and um, uh, what does it um, mean that the set is not recursively um, enumerable? That means that there's not a Turing machine which could um, um, which reads a number n as input and then outputs the nth uh, Turing machine for the nth total computable function. That's not possible. In other words, there is no Turing machine m which reads a number n as input and outputs um, um, a Turing machine computing the nth um, total computable function from n to n in some list of all total computable functions from n to n. That's not possible. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's some standard proof you can look up in textbooks on computability theory. I think also Wikipedia has the proof. Um, it's quite interesting and in order to carry out the proof, at some point you will need to um, construct a new Turing machine with a certain property. So you assume for the sake of contradiction that there is such an, a machine M and then from this machine M you construct a new machine and then you observe that we have a contradiction. To construct this new machine, you have two options. One is to think about what, what your experience with programming tells you and then trust that you could in principle, given enough time, construct the Turing machine required for the proof. Um, so you appeal to Church's thesis, or you actually invest the work and actually write down the, that Turing machine that will probably require a day, perhaps two days, perhaps a couple hours, depending on, on, on your experience with both things. So a full, fully formal proof of uh, this statement, um, if you actually want all the details right, is, um, is quite an issue. How can we do better in synthetic computability theory? This theorem can be expressed as follows. It will look different. It will look simpler, but it will um, have exactly the same meaning if we interpret what I will now write um, using the realizability semantics, namely, the set of um, all total functions, now I'm not saying to computable functions, is not countable. In other words, there's no function from n, um, I could call that m again, to the set of all functions from n to n. This is the set of all functions from n to n. Um, um, there's no subjective function. So now the theorem got, the, the statement of the theorem got much shorter. And also it doesn't appear to be about computability any longer. Now it's just a theorem um, about sizes of sets. And in fact, uh, yesterday, um, we, we happened to prove that. It was like on, on that, that blackboard. 
Um, and you'll mark that this can also be proven using Lovia's fixed point theorem, a very general theorem, which is not about computability uh, at all. It's just a very general theorem about fixed points. And using that theorem, we can prove this theorem, which doesn't look like it that it would tell us something about Turing machines. But if you now interpret the theorem in the effective topos, then we obtain exactly that. In particular, a fully formal proof of that is, uh, is easily possible. Um, I will add it as an exercise uh, on, um, as an ACTA exercise uh, in our exercise collection. Yeah? It will be in ACTA a couple of lines, right? 20 lines perhaps, depending on uh, how you subdivide your proof. Um, so far, so good. Um, let's talk about the halting problem. In ordinary computability theory, we have the following theory. Um, there is no halting oracle. In other words, there is no Turing machine um, um, H, which reads a Turing machine um, as input and um, outputs zero or one, depending on whether this input machine M terminates or not. Fundamental theorem in uh, computability theory. It should have a simple proof because it's a fundamental theorem. It should not have a proof involving prime numbers. It should have straightforward proof. Um, um, how does the proof work? Um, let's check. Okay, um, here's a sketch of the proof. Um, let, let's not read it in detail. Yeah, uh, the idea is they write some pseudocode, kind of looking like Python. Yeah, um, and then they have some argument, uh, and this apparently gives rise to a contradiction. However, um, this is still pseudocode in English. Um, um, uh, what we actually need to do is to uh, we need to construct a Turing machine, and that is not done here. Okay, now they say sketch of a rigorous proof. Okay, and now I see more formulas and stuff. Okay, but still I don't see an actual Turing machine. I don't see a diagram of a machine containing like twenty states, transitions between. Don't see that. Uh, Wikipedia says this is a rigorous proof. It's it's not a fully rigorous proof. At some point, it also appeals to, um, um, to Chess's thesis. Okay, in synthetic computability theory, this theorem can be expressed as follows. Um, it is not the case that um, um, let me use formal notation for all f from or for all m from n to n and for all inputs x i've been glossing over the possible inputs there um, m x terminates or mx um, um, does not terminate. This arrow here indicates that a capital M should be a partial function from n to n, a function which is allowed to not have a return value. Okay, and this here states for every partial function and for every number x, for every input x, either um, m applied to x terminates or m applied to x 
does not come. Okay. Uh, again, no mention of Turing machines. In particular, the proof of that will not require Turing machines. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that's the same from from that point of view. So uh, we don't distinguish between not delivering result because it aborts with an error message, or um, or uh, or because it gets trapped in an infinite loop on purpose, uh, like while true, or because it gets trapped in an, in some kind of loop not on purpose. We don't distinguish. We just say in that case the resulting uh, value is not defined. Notice, um, is that theorem provable in, uh, so the theorem, um, let, me, let me spell out that it is not the case using a negation there, yeah? So it's not the case. But, um, can we prove that in constructive mathematics? Yeah, good point, but we can provide a more forceful argument. Yeah. So you would expect that we can prove this statement with a negation in the front or that we cannot prove that. Yeah, you're right. We cannot prove that in constructive mathematics. Uh, and I think the quickest argument would be the following. If you could prove that in constructive mathematics, then we could also prove it in classical mathematics. Okay, but uh, in classical mathematics, the thing at the end here is just true because of the law of secluded middle. Um, hence, all of that will be true. And hence, the negation of that will be false. We cannot prove a false statement in classical mathematics. That is a kind of issue. Um, it's a difference, difference to what we did before. For instance, this theorem here about numbers, every number is prime or not, this is a constructive proof. And hence, it has a realizer. And that realizer is exactly the Turing machine required here, the Turing machine which checks whether a given number is prime or not. Okay. Also here, um, sorry. This theorem, the set of all total functions is not countable. We can prove that in constructive mathematics. And hence, there's a realizer for it. And that realizer um, will uh, exactly express the corresponding theorem in ordinary computability theory. However, we cannot prove that in constructive mathematics. Constructive mathematics is neutral about the law of student. We don't reject it. We just don't have it available. Yeah? Um, so from the point of view of constructive mathematics, this here is an open question. Um, correspondingly, we cannot obtain the theorem above, the theorem which we actually want to have, um, just from giving a constructive proof of that and then interpreting the result in the effective topos, because there is no constructive proof of that. We would still like to prove that in order to actually behind the scenes proof this year. And uh, for that, we need to introduce a non-classical axiom. Yeah. Um, uh, however, um, we cannot give a constructive proof of this theorem um, as there isn't even a classical proof. In order to give a proof, we need to postulate an anti-classical axiom. And the anti-classical axiom uh, to be postulated um, is the following. In fact, um, I'm simplifying history here a little bit because uh, this axiom here is the result of like 30 years of, of finding a good, good axiom. Yeah? Um, and I think the search is not yet completely over, but 
um, I believe that this axiom um, uh, it currently looks like this axiom is uh, is very nice. Yeah? Um, the axiom states um, there is um, a function theta from the naturals to um, to this, which is surjective. Um, by surjective, let me just say, let me just use this arrow with the two things, yeah, surjective. Yeah. And what I what should I write here? Here I will write um, the set of all partial functions, partial functions from n to n. This the set of all partial functions from n to n. So EPF states um, that this set is countable, that we have an enumeration of this set. Um, and um, yeah, um, and notice um, this axiom is wildly false in classical mathematics. Because how many partial functions are there from n to n? Um, well, there are the total functions from n to n, and then even more. How many total functions are there from n to n in classical mathematics? Uncountably many. Hence, there cannot be a subjection from the naturals to that uncountable set. The naturals are much smaller. Yeah. Yeah. It's the uh, state. Uh, it means um, extended um, parametric whatever for partial functions. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, so, um, yeah, people wrote down axioms and, um, and then they checked the following. Firstly, are the axioms true in the effective topos? If not, then it's just a fantasy and not interesting for the point of view of doing synthetic computability theory. And then secondly, they checked using that axiom, can we give proofs of all the interesting theorems of incomputability theory. And more precisely, how difficult are the proofs? Recall when, doing, uh, when pursuing a synthetic approach, we have the vision that all the fundamental proofs should be, should be easy in some sense, should be transparent, should be clear, should be, um, should be meaningful. No random prime numbers and four y plus nine appearing in it. And um, there are several axioms postulated over time. They, uh, all of them are true in the effective topos, but they um, have different, uh, they, they differ in how simple the resulting proofs become. And in fact, there are some axioms um, for which it isn't even possible to carry out all the proofs we would like to do in computability theory. And the jury is is still out, um, especially because computability theory is a growing subject, right? Um, so uh, it could conceivably happen that tomorrow some awesome theorem in, in computability theory is published, and then we try to do, do the proof in the effective topos, and then notice that this EPF axiom is not strong enough. That could theoretically possible uh, happen, but um, uh, I'm, I'm quite convinced of, of EPF, not because I would be an expert, um, but uh, because I had the great fortune of meeting experts like this um, uh, Janne Klaus Forster, and um, um, uh, and he very much likes that axiom, and uh, he, he's a very competent guy, and from that I, I, I draw my trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, with that axiom, we are assuming something which is not true in classical mathematics. Uh, 
It's also not true in constructive mathematics, um, um, but at least it's not false in constructive mathematics. And that's the reason why we can uh, consistently postulate that. Um, um, le le let me uh, try to write that down as a formula. Um, note, in intuitionistic logic, we can prove that if we have the law of student middle, and if we also have EPF, then bottom. Yeah. So you should read that as follows. The axiom lem and the axiom EPF, they are contradictory. You cannot have both at the same time. However, you can um, like pick sides and say, I prefer lem and add lem. To, to, to the basis of constructive mathematics, you can say, well, I will add lem, the law of student middle. Good morning, hello, you're welcome. And then you arrive at classic mathematics, a beautiful theory. And you can also say, well, okay, let me postulate EPF. And then you arrive also at a beautiful building, namely uh, synthetic computability theory. Yeah? Um, it's just your choice what, what, what you want to do. And um, of course, it will depend on applications what's more useful. If you want to do synthetic computability theory, you need to adopt EPF. If you want to have um, fun with discontinuous functions, you need to adopt them. Um, and about, but recall the following. Um, so just that we adopt EPF and thereby, thereby say goodbye to classical mathematics, that does not mean that we say goodbye to classical mathematics forever, not at all, because we have this realizability interpretation. Um, so EPF does not hold in classical mathematics. Um, hence, let me just say it again, EPF does not hold in classical mathematics. However, classical mathematics agrees that EPF is realized. Classical mathematics does not believe that EPF is true, but it does believe that it's realized. And uh, that is the connection between synthetic computability theory and ordinary computability theory. Um, if we want to convince a classical mathematician of some result in computability theory, a classical mathematician who very much wants to have LEM, yeah? um, then we can do the following. Um, we employ EPF and thereby shocking the classical mathematician. Using EPF, we now prove our theory, but then in the end, um, to unshock them, we say, well, what I just said, this beautiful proof, don't take it literally. Instead, um, check what it means using the realizability semantics. And then they will say, ah, oh, okay, cool, because they do agree that EPF is realized, and they agree that all the rules of reasoning employed by our proof are realized. That is what we did yesterday yeah, with those uh, many, many proof, uh, proof rules uh, this year. Yeah, yeah, where we checked that all the proofs, or many of the proofs are realizable. Um, and hence, the classical mathematician will conclude, aha, uh -huh, so the conclusion of your theorem, theorem is realized. And that is exactly what you wanted to convince them of. Yeah, so for instance, you wanted to convince them that there's no Turing machine H like this, there's no halting oracle. And how you do that is in the effective topos, perhaps using EPF, you prove this statement. And then at the end you say, well, observe, I was not working in the standard topos, I was working in the effective topos. And um, this theorem in the effective topos actually amounts to that theorem externally. That is how I do the connection. Um, I'd like to prove this theorem now. Let's prove the, unders uh, the undecidability of the, of the halting problem. Internally, in synthetic computability theory. Um, I cannot simply write down a constructive proof of that fact because there is no constructive proof of that fact, but I can write down a proof which is constructive um, except 
that it also uses EPF, an axiom about which constructive mathematics is agnostic about. That's, by the way, a, a great advantage of, of constructive mathematics. Constructive mathematics is agnostic about more things than classical mathematics. Classical mathematics has stronger opinions. It says lem is true, axiom of choice is true, and as a consequence, lots of other things which on their own would be interesting are false. Constructive mathematics is more open to more possibilities. And hence we can use uh, constructive mathematics as, um, as a basis for classical mathematics, it's just that lem needs to be added. But we can also use constructive mathematics as a basis for synthetic computability theory. In this case, EPF needs to be added. Or we can use constructive mathematics as a basis for all those other synthetic approaches, um, where again, depending on the approach, certain axioms need to be added to constructive mathematics, axioms which contradict classical mathematics, but which are fine on their own. OK, let's prove that. Um, proof. Um, assume for the sake of a contradiction, and that's the good kind of contradiction, uh, and because I just want to prove this theorem up there. This is a negated formula. To prove a negated formula, formula I assume this and derive a contradiction. Assume for the sake of a contradiction that this holds. Yeah. Then in particular, we have the following. Um, for all x, and now I'm using a very specific m here, namely the following, um, theta of x. Recall theta is a function which reads natural numbers as input and outputs certain partial functions, uh, namely in some ordering all partial functions. Yeah? Theta would be, will be an enumeration of all the partial functions. Here, yeah? Okay, and then I feed the same input x into the resulting partial function. And by assumption, I would have that the computation theta of x of x terminates or does not terminate. Okay, it's a, that's a special case in this to a particular m, namely to theta of x. Okay, and um, now, um, 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 let me do the following. Um, Um, just a second. Let me um, let me check uh, one of the other slides, namely this one. He had set in a slightly different context, um, and see whether I can transfer that to that. Um, sorry. Um, um, to not lose time, let me just do the, the context here. Yeah, so just let's go through that slide. Um, here they prove um, uh, something even stronger than what we just uh, wanted to prove, but right now I cannot um, quickly enough uh, transfer the stronger proof to the weaker claim we have. Um, uh, let's check that they want to prove um, uh, what they want to prove. So um, they have exactly, they, they, they start here. Here I say theta of x of x terminates or theta of x of x does not terminate. Yeah? And that is also what they, they are saying. It's just that they're writing theta index x instead of theta of x, okay? Um, by is undecidable, they mean that 
it's not the case that this holds or that this does not hold. So it's exactly what I wrote here. Okay, uh, and now um, they, they not only prove that, they prove a stronger statement, namely they prove the following. Um, they prove explicitly that for every candidate decider, one can construct a concrete value such that D of C diverges, does not terminate. Let me explain. What would be a candidate decider? That would be a function from the naturals to the booleans, true, false, such that um, if we input a number x into D, then dx results in false or true, depending on whether um, theta xx terminates or does not terminate. That would be a, a decider. Yeah? Um, uh, here you see a part of what it would, uh, of what it, uh, what a function makes a decider, namely um, dx terminates with true if and only if um, theta x x terminates. Yeah? So this decision function should output true if and only if theta x x terminates and else it should output false. Okay, but now um, they say that they can construct a concrete value C such that um, D of C diverges, contradicting um, the, the contract which D should satisfy. D should be a decider. So for every X, it should output a Boolean, true or false, uh, settling the question whether theta X, X terminates or not. But no, there's at least one C such that D of C diverges, does not give any answer at all. How do they do it? They construct an auxiliary function uh, from the naturals to the Boolean, a partial function. And it works like that. Um, f of x should be true in case d of x terminates with false. And in case d of x terminates with true or in case d of x doesn't terminate at all, um, the resulting value, uh, the, the, uh, f of x should also just be undefined. Let's quickly check that we can actually write down f in the setting we are in, in the setting of constructive mathematics. We need to check that because this is um, definition by cases. To do a definition by cases in constructive mathematics, we require that the first case holds or the second case holds. Let's quickly check whether that's whether we have that. And we don't have that here, spoiler. Um, we don't have that D of X terminates with F or not. That is exactly, a, an, that would be an instance of the law of excluded minimum. Um, but don't worry, the proof on the slide is correct um, because they are just claiming that this f here will be a partial function. Let me do a quick example to illustrate that, that point. Um, totally different thing. Uh, let's define a function from the reals to the reals um, like this, curly brace. Um, like this, and we say it should be minus one if x is smaller than zero, zero if x is zero, and one if x is larger than zero. Perfectly fine definition in classical mathematics. In constructive mathematics, that's not uh, a perfectly fine definition of a function from R to R, because in constructive mathematics, we don't have the theorem that every real number is smaller than zero, equal to zero, or larger than zero. However, this definition still defines a partial function. The following um, um, definition defines in constructive mathematics a partial function from the reals to the reals, yeah? what will be its domain? Its domain, the set of numbers on which it is defined, um, is the following set. It's the set of all those real numbers, which are smaller than zero, 
or equal to zero or larger than zero. On this subset of the real numbers, this function here is defined because for a number in this subset, it does hold true that it's smaller than zero or zero or larger than zero by definition of that subset. And in classical mathematics, this is not really a subset, it's all of the real line. Constructive mathematics, we cannot really know. Constructive mathematics, from the point of view of constructive mathematics, it's an open question whether um, this subset is all of R. But still the function is defined on this subset. No? Okay, and uh, here the same happens. Um, F of X, well, is defined on all those axes where uh, this holds, where this happens to hold a chance. On those axes, the resulting value is true. Well, okay, and that defines a partial function. And now in one line, let's have the desired contradiction. Um, uh, they say, using EPF, we obtain a code C for F. By that, uh, they just mean the following. Um, EPF um, states that, um, that every partial function is contained in the range of theta. Yeah? So for every partial function F from N, sorry, to N, there is a number C such that theta of C equals F. Yeah, but it just expresses the search activity. And what's here just called C is called a code here on the slide. Okay, and now we check the following. When does it happen that D of C happens to terminate with true? Well, by assumption that happens exactly if, uh, if that holds, just with the C. Now, if we look at the definition of that, then this means that theta C of C terminates. Um, now recall, theta C is precisely the function F because C is not an arbitrary number, but a code for F. So we have that FC terminates. Um, when does FC terminate? Let's have a look. When does it terminate? Well, not in this case, only in this case. Okay, if FC terminates at all, it terminates with top as a resulting value. Okay, and when does it happen that um, FC terminates with top? Well, only in this case. In that case, it does not terminate with top. So we have this equivalence, DC terminates with F. And now we have a contradiction because we have proven that DC terminates with value T if and only if DC terminates with value F. Now we have proven uh, the halting problem in its synthetic variant. And note that at no point we needed to explicitly write down a 20 stage gene machine with lots of transitions. It was a synthetic proof using just constructive mathematics and EPF as an addition. That's it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think I just want to add one more remark. Uh, stolen from one of those slides and then uh, stop doing that. Um, yeah, let me just mention that, um, yeah, perhaps you are now interested and perhaps you would now want to start actually like learning the synthetic computability theory from the start and not like these three cherry pick examples. Um, everything what you need for that, you have available, you have constructed mathematics available, you know what this is approximately. Um, and now you can just open some paper on synthetic computability theory and yeah, st start it from the top till you don't want anymore. And um, yes, get surprised in which simple language we can express 
when on theorem from computability theory and how simple the proofs become. Yeah. Um, uh, but because I was not as well prepared as I could have been, yeah, we, we struggled slightly with that proof here. Yeah. Um, but but uh, imagine that I would have been better prepared then I would have been able to present that in a better way. And then very quickly you would say, ah, cool, that, that is a proof of the synthetic culture problem. Yeah. And that one remark I want to do is the following. Um, do, we even need, do we even need um, being this formal? Is it not okay to, to just appeal to Church's thesis? Um, and there you will find different opinions when you talk with people. Uh, Yannick thinks, um, yes, we definitely need um, a full formalization of computability theory. And that is only reasonably possible with synthetic computability theory, but because if you do the unsynthetic approach, then you obtain horrors like that. And he gives a couple of examples um, why, why we actually need machine check proofs in computability theory. In 1932, Gödel claimed something. Don't, don't care what precisely. In 1984, um, Goldfarb showed that what Gödel claimed there was false. There was a mistake in Gödel's argument, which was not noticed in the time between 32 and 1984. In 1988, these three people proved a certain fact. Five years later, the same group of people proved the contrary to that fact. They discovered an error in their own proof. 2015, um, this person proved something. 2019, somebody found an error in the proof and it's currently an open problem. Um, um, and especially this Gödel result is quite shocking because lots of results depended on, on Gödel's claim. And it's a thing which we luckily seldomly enough have, but they appear, they do appear again and again that results turn out to be false after they have been published. In particular, if the results are uh, of a like, technical manner where the proof is like hairy and complex and you don't really feel like checking all the details. And in particular, if the author is a well-known trusted author, yeah? if a paper of Gödel, you wouldn't think that it contains a, a grave error. But still it happens again and again. And um, machine check proofs can defend us against that, but they require a good foundation so that we don't have these sorrows. Yeah? And these foundations are provided by synthetic accounts of, uh, of the subject in question. And um, I, I think many of you have heard of homotopy type theory. Yeah? Very, very hot, uh, sorry for that. Very hot, uh, wasn't intended, a very hot topic in computer science, mathematics, homotopy theory. It provides a synthetic foundation for a certain branch of mathematics called homotopy theory, which is about shapes and their deformations. Uh, it turns out that this branch, um, that uh, synthetic homotopy theory is also useful for other stuff unrelated to shapes and, and, their, uh, and, um, and related things. Um, and it was born because uh, Wojewodzki, this person here, um, um, encountered the following situation. Um, I think in the 90s, he proved a certain theorem. Um, it was very well received. It was a very important theorem. Um, lots of mathematicians discussed the theorem. They had seminars on it where, where they went through the proof. Um, uh, I don't know whether before that or by that or after that, he earned the Fields Medal, the highest prize in mathematics. And then like 15 years later, he noticed that he made an error in Lemma 1.1 of his article. And that really like, got him thinking. He was not a logician at all. He was a serious homotopy theorist. Uh, he for sure did not know the axioms of ZFZ or did know ACTA, nothing of that. He was a generic mathematician. But then he started getting interested in that circle of ideas. Um, and, uh, that laid, uh, and then he laid the foundation for homotopy type theory. Um, and um, yeah, homotopy th type theory is nowadays uh, 
an awesome foundation for doing homotopy theory, where you can do homotopy theory um, directly from the start without um, having to uh, you encode everything as sets, which will take you a long while uh, and which will be hard to formalize. Um, and the, the end vision of, um, uh, or the grand vision of Wojewodski was to um, develop homotopy type theory, not only so that we have an easier time doing ordinary homotopy theory, uh, but also to be able at all to do certain kinds of mathematics, which are currently with, with, uh, um, not within the reach of humans, because the proofs just get too complicated in the current foundation we have. Yeah? With here, um, there were people who powered through, especially in the court. court. It, it was a nuisance, but they, they managed to do it, and they succeeded. Uh, Wojewodski dreamt of uh, subjects or areas in mathematics which are so hard that in the current in the standard foundation of set theory, they just cannot be carried out by a human, perhaps by some extraterrestrial who's smarter, it might work, but not by a human. That was his grand plan. In, uh, let's just have five, uh, five more minutes. Um, I would like to define the circle in ACTA. And I, for defining the circle in ACTA, I will not need the real numbers. I will not need pi. I will not need the sine function. It will just be, um, I think, three lines of code. OK, let me define the circle. Um, OK, what's up? I lost my window. OK, uh, data circle. So right now, it would be the empty data type. Um, the circle shouldn't be empty. And now I will postulate um, the existence of a certain point, namely the North Pole, the topmost point of the circle. OK. Um, there's, if I would stop now, then I would have to find um, um, a space which contains exactly one point, namely point called North Pole, but it would not yet be an actual circle. Now, let me turn it into a circle. Uh, what does the circle have more than just its North Pole, its topmost point? The analytic answer would be to say, well, the circle has many, many more points. In fact, uncountably many. And I can get all those points by using the sine and cosine function. The synthetic uh, answer would be, well, what does a circle have more than its North Pole? Well, it has a path from the North Pole to the North Pole again. I will give a name to that path. I will call it North uh, Loop. And um, I define this uh, path using this syntax. You might think, Ham, uh, wasn't that the syntax in ACTA to talk about equality of, uh, of things? And it was. But in cubicle ACTA, um, uh, an amazing fact happens. Namely, we can use the same notation not only for stating that two things are equal, equal, but also for stating that we have a path from the left to the right-hand side. I'm not meaning that in the sense that um, like ACTA will, depending on context, figure out what we meant. Uh, no, it's much more fundamental to that. Uh, recall, ACTA also doesn't make a difference between proving stuff and programming stuff, because it's to, uh, to ACTA, it's one and the same. And that's uh, the similar thing happens in cubicle ACTA. Um, ACTA does not need to know whether I mean that as a, as a path or as an identification, because in cubicle ACTA, identifications and paths are one and the same. And we have a further unification. That's the circle. Let's define the unit interval. Classically, so I would, uh, so classically, it, that would be the set of all those real numbers, um, which are um, uh, between zero and one. Okay. And to define that, I would first need to define the real numbers and then the less than relation. And uh, then I can write down the set 
but it's as yet just a set, not a topological space. I also need to put a topology on it and so on and so forth. It will require some time until I have actually arrived at the topological unit. In cubicle actor, it's three lines of codes. Um, we need to, uh, the interval has a leftmost point. I will call it start. It also has a rightmost point. I will call it end. If I would stop now, then I would have to find the space which contains two points and nothing more. And now we say, well, there should also be a segment from start to end. Three lines of code, four lines of code to define the interval. And that is quite an amazing achievement of, um, of, uh, of, of homotopy type theory. Let me conclude with one more example unrelated to shapes. Instead, let me define the integers. Okay. Um, just a plain old set of integers. How to define that? Um, uh, well, there's lots of ways how to, how to construct the integers from the, uh, from the naturals. Um, and one which I particularly like because it allows us to have streamlined addition, definitions of addition, multiplication, and so on, is to remember how the integers fought their way into our society, namely in finance, where we had, um, uh, where we can either have money or owe money, right? Um, for instance, um, if I have uh, three euros. Uh, and I owe someone five euros, yeah? um, then in total, I have um, minus two euros, right? Okay. Um, and if I have four euros and I owe someone six euros, I also have minus two euros. Okay, how to express these ideas in ACTA? Uh, well, I say, um, I have an operation, um, like this. So for instance, I can write three minus five. I can, and I can also write uh, four minus six. Right now, this is just a funny notation for pairs. Right now, if I would stop now, the set of integers would be the set of pairs of two natural numbers. So for instance, the pair three, five, or the pair four, six. That wouldn't yet be an accurate representation of the integers because in the integers, three minus five is the same as four minus six. They're not distinct. So we need a little bit more. And that is an additional identification given to natural numbers. We could form X minus Y and we could also form suck X minus suck Y and what we need to postulate is that these yield the same. Okay, and now with three lines of code, I have defined the integers. Making use of that idea of like paths, uh, but, uh, but without being interested in shapes um, per se, we just use them to our advantage. Good, let's stop here. Uh, I'm open for all questions. I'm open for having lunch. I'm open, open for whatever. And then at 13.30, we continue with the um, session on extracting constructive content from classical 